Good morning and welcome to worship with Willow Avenue Mennonite Church. If we haven't met before, my name is Audrey Hines. I'm the pastor here at Willow Avenue where Jesus welcomes all and so do we. Whether you're here with us in person or on Zoom or Facebook Live, we're so glad that you are with us this morning. Today is the second Sunday of Advent and our theme during this season is let us walk in the light of the Lord. As we prepare for Christmas, we pray that the gifts of this season will transform us to become more and more and more like Christ. Last Sunday, that gift was hope. And today, the gift we focus on is peace. But it is not simply peace that is the absence of conflict. When we are standing up for God's justice and righteousness, we very often will find ourselves at odds with others especially those with power and privilege. The scripture readings this morning speak of wishes, desires, and the hint of this fulfillment that is Christmas. We're grateful to Lynn Jost for his prayerful preparation this morning for the message on the gift of peace. Thank you, Lynn. Today is also our Blue Christmas lunch, and this is a special time to acknowledge that the holidays are not always merry and bright for everyone. A little bit later in the service, you'll all be welcome to text your joys or concerns that you carry in your own hearts and minds. And to support those of us who struggle to enjoy this season, I particularly invite your laments. A lament isn't just complaining or crying. A lament is a passionate expression of grief fear, or frustration that trusts and waits for God to respond. You can begin texting these joys, concerns, or laments at any time now to 559-960-8777. And so now I invite us to take a moment to quiet our hearts and minds as we prepare for worship. I invite you to stand in body or spirit and turn to number 222 in your purple hymnal, My Soul Proclaims with Wonder.
be seated. During the four Sundays leading up to Christmas, we light one candle in the Advent wreath each Sunday. On Christmas Eve, we'll light the fifth candle. Advent means coming. It is a time of longing, watching, and praying for God's healing, transformative presence to be ever more vibrantly present in the world. In this sense, Advent is a season in which we focus on that key phrase in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come. As Christians, the good news we strive to live by and declare is that love is stronger than hate, peace more enduring than war, hope more powerful than despair, and the light of God's love will dispel forever the shadows of shame cast by violence, suffering, sorrow, and contempt. Because of violence in our communities, because there is still so much unrest in our hearts, we light a candle of peace. Because hatred is still so strong, because so many swords have not yet been remade into plowshares, we light a candle of peace. May the light from this candle overwhelm the world. May the light from this candle say to all that God's peace is coming on earth as it already is in heaven. Friends, be not afraid. God's peace is at hand. So I'd like to invite the children to come forward for a blessing. If you would, good morning, good morning, good morning. I think there might still be more coming from the nursery, uh, but the ones in the nursery are littler, and so they might not remember. I wonder if you can remember all the way back to March of 2020. That was so long ago. No, I know. So that was when we used to have you go out to godly play right after we gave the children's blessing and then for a long time we had church on zoom and then for another long time we've had the canopy of wonder out here during the service so that you could hang out during the service right but what happened what changed last week do you remember we went to the nursery you went to the nursery right now i thought marlis came and got you and took you somewhere Good morning, good morning. So last week, you got to start going back out to godly play right after this blessing. Do you remember that? Yeah? So way, way, way back before March of 2020, we often sang you a blessing. Do you remember that? Well, maybe you'll remember it as we sing it to you now. It's number 835 in your hymnal, but you might remember it by heart if you were with us at that time. So we are gonna sing a blessing to you as you go out to godly play. Marlis is already here to take you to godly play. And we want you to remember that we love you and God loves you. And we are so glad that you're here. And we're glad that the rest of you are here too. So let us sing our blessing as the children go out to godly play. You may go. Go now in peace, go now in peace, may the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. As we begin this time of uniting our hearts together with God's in prayer for the church, community, and world, 
a reminder that you can text your prayer requests, your joys, your concerns, your laments to 559-960-8777. Let us pray. Lord of mercy and peace, open our hearts to receive your words of hope. We live far too much in darkness and fear. We have let the fears invade the very center of our lives and find ourselves changing, moving from the light to the darkness of despair. It seems that this world and its people are more pleased to fight and destroy than we are to have peace and harmony. We become a part of that when we wallow in anger, resentment, apathy, and greed. Forgive us, patient and merciful God. Help us be people who will look at the ways in which we have blocked your presence, ways in which we have truly failed to be your people. Give us courage and strength to change our lives, that your peace may become a reality in this world, right now, this day. As I lift up each prayer from within our community the word, with the words, Lord, in your great love, I invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. We pray with Gary Barber, with the discovery of a melanoma stage three on his left deltoid. We pray for effective consultations and treatment in the coming week. Lord, in your great love. From Joe Brewster, prayers for his aunt as she has another knee replacement tomorrow. Also for his family, as they grieve the passing of his uncle yesterday morning. Lord, in your great love. From Scott Henderson, Joe Vigil's brother-in-law. For his mother who's in hospice with Heinz Hospice, prayers for a peaceful and pain-free passing. We lift up Vicki Henderson. Lord, in your great love. And from Carol Vigil, prayers for Vicki's husband, Greg, and daughter, Brittany. Lord, in your great love. For Margie Stewart, who is having a dual round of surgery this Friday for fibroids. Lord, in your great love. Teach us, O oh God, how to live peaceably with ourselves and with each other. If someone is angry, help us not to respond defensively, but to listen and seek understanding. If someone is hurting, remind us how you have consoled us in our own affliction, that we might offer consolation to them. If someone is oppressed and needs an advocate, grant us courage to stand with them, strong, clear, and unafraid. Make us instruments of your holy peace. Amen. Would you please stand and turn to number 218 in your hymnal as we prepare our hearts and minds for the readings of the second week of Advent. Thank you. 
Please be seated. Please stand for the meeting of the gospel. <laughs> the gospel harbors a vivid memory of one potential portrait of the coming Messiah. Though Jesus did not fulfill this expectation literally, elements of it remain in the church's hope. Matthew 3, 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the desert of Judea, announcing, change your hearts and lives. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. He was the one of whom Isaiah the prophet spoke when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. People from, people from Jerusalem throughout Judea and all around the Jordan River came to him. As they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. Many Pharisees and Sadducees came to be baptized by John, and he said to them, you children of snakes, who warned you to escape from the angry judgment that is coming soon? Produce fruit that shows you have changed your hearts and lives, and don't even think about saying to yourself, Abraham is our father. I tell you that God is able to raise up Abraham's children from these stones. The ax is already at the root of the trees, Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be chopped down and tossed into the fire. I baptize you with water, those of you who have changed your hearts and lives. The one, is coming, the one who is coming after me is stronger than I am. I'm not worry, worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The shovel he uses to, shove, to sift the wheat from the husk is in his hands. He will clean out this, his threshing area and bring the wheat into his barn, but he will burn the husks with fire that cannot be put out. May we find God's wisdom in these words. Amen. And please turn with me to number 217. This is our new song for the week. Wisdom and 
might and sail on love his holy breast in He comes to prisoners to release in Satan's bondage held. The gates of brass before him burst, the iron fetters yield. He comes a broken heart to blind, the bleeding soul. I'll be reading from Psalm 72, verses 1 through 7 and 18 and 19. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people give deliverance to the children of the needy and crush the oppressor. May they fear you while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like the rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. May his name whoops, 18 and 19. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. May we find God's wisdom in these words. Amen. On Friday, uh, in the funny papers, today's lesson appeared. In Pearls Before Swine, the mouse, and I suppose if we have been called vipers this morning, it's okay for us to hear from mice and pigs as well. Uh, mouse asks, what do you do when an angry driver cuts you off? Do you swear at them? Do you make rude gestures? Or do you cut them off in retaliation. Peace Pig replies, I try to focus on what must be happening in their life to make them so hostile and unhappy. Mouse replies, maybe you're not understanding. And Pig says, no, but I'm trying to be. Peacemaking is our aim today. In the Gospel of Luke, we have this Christmas song that really uh, speaks to us at Advent. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, who's been silent for nine months, finds his tongue, and his song concludes in the tender compassion of God. The dawn from on high shall break upon us to guide our feet. I think our theme is in the way of light and here to guide our feet into the way of peace. 
Advent Christmas Peace. If you're from California, peace is that snow shaker that settled beautifully. If you're from the Midwest where you get snow, it's more like a, a Hawaii island or something like that that is your picture of perfect peace. What blocks peace for you right now? Is there one, or maybe it's a list of things, that's keeping you, it's a family member's illness or struggle. It's a place in the world that's dear to you. You're from there, or you have relatives there. What is it that's blocking your peace? I, I'm going to ask you to actually think about that for a moment. Uh, Stan, if, if anybody waves their hand at you, it means they don't have a pencil. Would you write it or draw a little picture of it right next to the logo on the back of your bulletin? What's blocking peace for you? Can you identify one thing? A big thing or wave at him. Maybe the thing blocking your peace is some preacher asking you to do something during the sermon, and you really are irritated by that. That's okay, too. It's an easier thing to identify, anyhow. Okay, now something even stranger I'm going to ask you to do, and that is, if you'd like to keep thinking silently, just put your arm across your shoulder. But if you're okay with sharing with the person next to you, just in a tiny half a minute, three words, share what that item is. Okay, you got permission to talk. Things are getting very strange, I know. Okay, I hope there were no accusations. I see that no fist fight started, so we haven't had too many people say, Rocky, you're blocking my peace. That's good. It's really good that you didn't say that, and nor did you even think about it. Okay, uh, so we've got peace on our minds, but we've got John the Baptist in our ears shouting about making peace. The thing that John contributes to our thinking this morning is his refusal to be tamed. He is an undomesticated voice who reminds us that peace is not just shaking up that snowflake thingy. Peace is something that extends into the systems and the powers of our world. And it's, yeah. I used to think that the metaphor to use when you talk about peace was to drop a pebble into the middle of a quiet pond and watch the waves go out until they reach the edges of the earth. I'm not so sure it works that way anymore. I'm not even sure that that's what Luke or any of the Matthew or the gospel writers would have said. I wonder if peace doesn't even begin with announcing peace to the powers that there's a new 
in-breaking way of thinking about the world. And as it works, it works its way straight into our hearts. Or maybe it starts at all different places at different times. I'm not sure about how to work the metaphor. But I am sure that we are called not to allow our peace to become domesticated and just to make sure it's okay between us is all it takes. There's something deeper and bigger that's going on with this call to peacemaking. The psalm says that where there is no justice, there is no peace. That in order to know peace, one must know justice. The psalm uses three Hebrew words to get into this, to unpack it. You see them in the top left quadrant there. It's not important that you remember the words, that you learn how to pronounce them or any of that kind of thing. But it is important to know that even though shalom is translated peace and mishpat is translated justice and tzedakah is translated righteousness, those English approximations are sometimes pretty weak tea compared to what the words actually mean in Scripture. Peace and justice, according to this 72nd Psalm, are very close synonyms. They mean almost the same thing. So if you were reading in the order in which the Hebrew words come to us in Psalm 72, you would notice, first of all, that there's this little superscription, those tiny little letters on top that say, of Solomon. What the word of should be translated is not at all clear. It might be written to Solomon, take that Solomon, or in the Solomonic style, or it might be written by Solomon. And then the psalm opens, God, your mishpat, give to the king, and your tzedakah to the king's son. And notice how often those two words keep popping up. In verse 3, our versions all, I think, read prosperity to your people. Sounds like a, a political slogan, doesn't it? Vote Democrat and be prosperous. The word is shalom to your people in righteousness. Solomon is the king who succeeds in ways that no other biblical king succeeds. And he probably fails to the same extent. You know, Solomon is a wise king. He's the king of peace. He's the prosperous king. He's been assigned one job by the book of Deuteronomy. It's in the book of the Kings. It's right in the middle of that book. And it's the law of the king in Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20. The one job he has is to read the Bible every day. Make a copy of this law and read it daily. And there's some things he's supposed to avoid, which don't sound very Solomonic at all. He's not to accumulate wealth or weaponry or wives. Now, it says not too many wives. I don't know what that line is, but somewhere between one and a thousand, you cross that line. Uh, for some of us, it's after one wife would be too many, but maybe somebody can handle more. We know Solomon crossed the line. This text counters the king's justice. Oh, if you're wondering about the king's justice, 1 Samuel chapter 8, the people are asking for a king, eventually they get Saul, but God tells Samuel, warn the people about the ways of a king. Only, again, we're avoiding the translation of this word mishpat, because it's warn the people of the king's mishpat, not God's mishpat, but the king's mishpat. And then he goes on to list all the ways the king is going to try to grab stuff. He'll take your daughters to be his perfumers. He'll take his sons to run your chariots. 
He'll take your flocks and your herds and your fields. It'll all be his by the time this is over. That's the king's mishpat. That's Madison Avenue's mishpat. That's the Security and Exchange Commission's mishpat. That's the military industrial complex mishpat. That's the American way. God's mishpat is described in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 17, 18, and 19, which say, God of gods and Lord of lords makes, guess what? The only word you have to know in my class is to get an A, mishpat. Make mishpat for orphans and widows and feed and clothe orphans. Actually, it doesn't say it quite like that. It says, God is the God who makes justice for orphans and widows and loves the undocumented aliens. And then it says, and you should do the same. Imitate God, be a peacemaker by turning your life into a, another way of practicing justice. It's not lawyer up. It's open your pocketbook and your heart and your life to extend what is more than fair to the person who is more than without. How do you do this kind of thing? How can you make peace in Ukraine without having bigger weapons than the Russians have? Uh, this month's Sojourner magazine has a short article about the way in which Ukrainians have been working for peace in nonviolent ways for a long time. I grew up thinking that peacemaking was non-resistance. Jesus resisted evil all the time. Peacemaking is nonviolent resistance, according to the witness of Jesus. Uh, this artist, Sergei, is, has a mural in which a sword is being broken. And it stands at the foot of a bunch of tall apartment buildings. It's been standing there since the war, and as far as we know, it's still standing. One of several fragments of peace, I think, is the, the name of the series of these murals. A way of giving testimony to peace. All kinds of ways Ukrainians have been doing this. They've been making blockades in front of Russian tanks. They've been refusing to teach the, the new curriculum given by the Russians in the Ukrainian schools. Doctors have refused to turn over their lists to the Russians. Pastors have preached for peace. Hundreds, if not thousands of people, have been disappeared, arrested, and killed because they refused to take up weapons, in addition to the many thousands who've resisted evil by using weapons. And who's to know as a pacifist what do you do to fix a problem where there are more weapons in the world than, than anything? These are people that are giving witness to peace, and they're giving us a call this morning. What will it mean for you to be a peace extender? Either with that item that you've already identified as a peace blocker in your life, or in some undomesticated way that God is calling us to give testimony to peace in the face of institutions that shut down witnesses for peace. How do we give a peace witness in those situations? How do we witness for peace when the homeless guy next to us is messing up our property values? He's just making a mess of things anyhow. How do we extend peace? Rosemarie Berger, in the, the author of this article, concludes with words like these. War makes us blind, blind to the good, blind to the humanity of others. 
And we are called to follow the artist Sergei to be breaking swords in the name of peace. A little footnote, on his murals, Sergei has put in Braille a little note that says hope. That's next week, isn't it? Or was that last week? Hope, peace, joy, and love continue to build as we practice these ways of peace. I want to invite you to take just a moment to jot down on your page one way in which you'd like to take a step toward being a peace proclaimer in this week. And if you want to whisper it to somebody on the way up to take communion, you can do that too. At the table of Christ, we eat this bread and drink this cup to remember the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, to be united with Christ and one another as the church, and to look forward to a time of peace when all will be one. As we eat and drink with thanksgiving, Jesus is present with us, and we are empowered by the Spirit to follow Jesus' way of hope, peace, joy and love as the body of Christ, broken and blessed for the life of the world. Please join with me in the responses on the screen. The table has been prepared as Jesus requested. We are invited to the meal. Come to the table. Like Peter with more enthusiasm than resolve, like James and John dismayed by the priorities of God's reign, come to the table like martha hosting and leading with confidence like mary full of love and grief come to the table like judas disillusioned and rebellious like mary magdalene faithful to the end come to the table jesus offers the bread and the cup come to the table of christ O oh God, ancient of days, your love brought galaxies into being, summoned water and sky, earth and all creatures, and made us in your image. Through the ages you have cared for all you created. When we wandered, you called us to return to you. In the fullness of time, you sent us the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to teach the law of love. He lived what he taught and loved his enemies to the end. In wonder, we remember the life Jesus lived, laid down, and took up for us again. Send your spirit upon us so that we, the bread that we break and the cup that we share may be the communion of the body of Christ. Send your spirit upon us so that we can live conform to Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. This meal is filled with life. The warmth of the sun the kindness of the rain, the mysteries of the soil, and the grace of human labor. As we eat and drink, we give thanks for the goodness of food, 
the delight of friendship and the love of Christ in this meal. Come, Holy Spirit, feast with your people. Amen. Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, when you share bread together, remember me. Blessed are you, abundant God, for you made bread to strengthen us. You gave us this bread as a sign of your body. Let our sharing be a taste of the bread of heaven that feeds the world. Amen. Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant. When you drink it together, remember me. Blessed are you, bountiful God, for you made the fruit of the vine to nourish us. You gave us this cup as a sign of your blood. Let our sharing be a taste of the wine we shall drink in your joyful feast. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In a moment, we'll invite you to come forward and receive these gifts of bread and cup, holding them until we have all formed a circle around the sanctuary. Starting this Sunday, we have gluten-free crackers available as well. As you come, whether you um, would like to receive the elements or simply receive a blessing, we would like you to be a part of this moment of communion. When all who finished, when all who have their elements have come, we will eat and drink together with those in person and those on our Zoom community.
friends, this is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Let us eat together. And this is the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us drink together. Let us pray. In deep gratitude for this moment, this meal, these people, we give ourselves to you, O Lord. Send us to live as changed people because we have shared the living bread and cannot remain the same. Ask much of us, expect much from us, enable much by us, encourage many through us. Amen. You may be seated. A few things that I'd like to make you aware of this morning, whether you're here in person or you're online with us. Um, the first is that at the conclusion of our service this morning, we'll have a fellowship time. So if you're online, I um, encourage you to spend the time uh, getting to catch up with one another. And if you're here in person across the way in the fellowship hall, we'll have refreshments. So please do um, take opportunity to do that. We have a number of things happening in our second hour this morning, starting at 11 o'clock. Um, the friendship class will be meeting, so they've got their special class over here. Um, sermon talk, so opportunity to kind of um, talk about what we've heard from Lynn this morning or anything in this service um, together. That will take place in the conference room. So if you just go through the office down to the conference room, that'll be taking place. Um, the youth are going to be decorating a Christmas tree and have cookie and cider. So that's in the youth room. I hate to mention these because you might want to all go to these too, because next, um, the children, none of whom are in the room, obviously, because they're all doing godly play, um, they're going to be with Rocky and Lynette and Donna going, um, reading through the book Too Many Tamales, which is by um, Fresno author Gary Soto, which is about kind of Hispanic family traditions around Christmas. Um, so they'll be listening, reading, wearing items from the story, using their hands, nose, and eyes to learn about those traditions. So um, that is going to be a great time. So. I'm not sure if you're allowed to sneak into those other rooms, but there's a lot of really good things happening, I guess is my point, uh, in the second hour this morning. And then afterwards, is it the second, second hour? The third hour? I don't know what we call, at 12 o'clock, so at the conclusion of both of those, uh, all of those events, um, we'll be having our special blue Christmas lunch. You can read the details in the bulletin, and that will be taking place in the conference room. Um, Pastor Audrey's prepared um, soup, and it's a time of sharing, um, as she mentioned earlier. At the same time, there'll be godly play, story practice in the fellowship hall. So um, quite a bit of things happening kind of this morning. Um, if you have any questions about those, feel free to ask us. And we'd be glad to tell you more or the details are in here. Um, quickly, um, I wanted to say thank you um, for all the people who give in different ways around here, making this place physically um, what we get to experience as well as giving their time and gifts and serving. Um, thank you to all of those who give financially to make everything happen as well. Um, we do this together, and so thank you for that. Also, on the last, the first Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, which is today, um, which is when we do communion, we also like to make special mention of our Deacons Fund. Um, our Deacons Fund is a special fund established to help people in need um, beyond our normal operating budget. Um, and just wanted to give you these numbers. We'll put them in the email so you can see them again. But so far this year, um, we've given $10,400 out in Deacon's Fund disbursements of various sorts, um, groceries, utilities, helping people with gas, rent, and other physical needs. So a lot of needs have been met through that particular fund this year. 12 different people or families um, are included in that amount. 
Um, so thank you to everyone who gives to that. That sort of happens kind of behind the scenes, um, but I wanted you all to be aware of that. And currently there's about $1,800 in that fund. So um, we're always making an appeal on these Sundays, but I want to give a special appeal as the last first Sunday of the month, um, that if you'd like to give toward the Deacon's Fund, you can always do that, whether you give online or physically, and just note that it's for the Deacon's Fund, and we'll put that into that special fund. Um, quickly, be sure to look through the announcements inside of your bulletin this morning. I won't cover all of them, just a few right now, but be looking through those. Um, I want to give special mention to a card, this card, as a matter of fact, that's going to be in the Fellowship Hall. Um, so Andrea, our church administrative assistant um, has got a new job and she's going to be leaving us in a few weeks and so we wanted to just say thank you to her by signing this card I would love if we filled this up and I had to buy another card um, for next Sunday so um, please do just write a little note to Andrea she does so many things around here those of you who work through the office know all the things that she does um, many of them are behind the scenes but it's a lot of the administrative things that make our lives work and this church work so sign the card um, Wednesday at 3 p.m. will be Irene Searing's memorial service here. Um, so I invite you to that. The details are in the bulletin as well, um, followed by a supper. supper. Um, do keep Marlis and the family in mind this week. Um, we all know these are difficult weeks, so let's be praying for her and for them and giving encouragement. And then lastly, you'll note some of the details about our story and song Christmas, which is on Sunday, the 18th of December at 5 p.m. So I just want to tell you two things about it. One, you should come. <laughs> it's going to be really fun. Bring friends. It's a night of um, songs and poems. And you know, it's, so it's going to be a really good uh, set of things happening. And you should consider doing one of those songs or poems or those kinds of things. They can be fun. They can be serious. They can be beautiful. Whatever you want. That's kind of what makes the whole evening really good. But um, we want to just make sure you're aware of that evening and you're planning on coming. And if you've got something to contribute, speak with Joe. So um, he'd be glad to help work that into the program for that night. So Joe, why don't you come? And I'll invite you to stand if you're here um, as we conclude our service with Voices Together 212. Comfort, comfort, oh my people. And as you stand, please prepare yourselves. This is an opportunity to make a joyful no noise with something other than your voice. So you'll hear some percussion in the congregation and you'll also if you want to use teamwork you could clap along with the song so number 212 comfort comfort ye my people comfort comfort all my people speak of peace now says our god Comfort those who sit in shadows, mourning neath their sorrows, Lord. Speak unto Jerusalem of the peace that wait for them. Tell of all the sins I cover, and that warfare now is over. Hark the voice of one who's crying in the desert far and near, bidding all to full repentance since the kingdom now is here. Oh, that warning cry obey, now prepare for God away. Valleys rise in exaltation, hills bow down in adoration. Oh, make straight what long was crooked, make the rougher places plain. Let your hearts be true and humble, as befits the lowly reign. For the glory of our God, now our earth is shed abroad, and all flesh shall see it token that God's word is never broken. Receive now this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and grant us peace. Amen, and go in peace.
Okay, friends, the piano has stopped and it's just us uh, listening in. Dennis and Nancy, I see your tree in the background. I think that's a beautiful, you're the first one that I've seen so far. We haven't put up ours yet. So uh, uh, Jeannie and my birthday falls in December. So my family always had the tradition that they would wait until after my birthday before they put up the Christmas tree.